afternoon. Uh, really good to be here. Thank you for coming or for staying. Um, did anyone get to crash this Braintree party last night? It was amazing. Crazy party nights here. We didn't expect that. Ooh. OK, so I'm going to be doing a few things today. Talk, a bit of a demo. Um, I was asked, I have a clicker here. Where's my clicker? I was asked to talk a little bit about the augmented reality and how can it impact our lives, and what do we do? And typically, when we talk about augmented reality in the news, we usually see things about advertisement and shopping. And we do something very different. We see augmented reality as, uh, as a tool that can be applied to enhance the lives of people, for example, with partial sight. So a quick crash course into what it means to lose your sight in the next 12 months. Usually, people don't go blind overnight, and most of people don't go blind completely. So you lose your sight bit by bit, and usually what it means is you struggle to read, you struggle to interact with your computer, your smartphone. Over time, um, your, your vision loss means that you cannot access things that we take for granted, such as public transportation. You can't commute, you can't get around. And even things that would take, give us pleasure and also are necessary for our survival, such as shopping, they're typically out of question. And this is a story for almost 300 million people around the world, but the tools haven't really evolved much over the last 25 years. So we're still really down to these clunky big devices that are supposed to help us, but they're not really giving us the independence and mobility that we really need. So the solution that we worked on um, by, by the way, to the stage guys, like my timer is still frozen to 18 and a half minutes. So, um, so what we do, uh, here we go, now it goes. So what we do, we've built software which powers, that's me there, here we go. It powers smart glasses and wearable hands-free devices to act as a guide for blind people. It can recognize text, it can recognize places, objects, bus numbers. It can sort of guide you to where you need to get, um, describe the, what's in your environment. Um, or you know, you can read out the cooking instructions, for example, or some papers. And we've been working on this for over a year right now to see if this could be the way to give independence and mobility for people who need it, we think, the most. Uh, we've been working on this now for over, yeah, since last summer. Um, and we have tested with, within the UK, we have 180 users living with these glasses. Not living, but tested the glasses already, and we're looking to launch next year. Um, I've often told that it's a really a risky thing to do, which is do a demo live on the stage, because if it goes wrong, um, it's not going to look very good. But what I have here today, I have a few prompts here, and maybe we can do a demo together. The way it's going to work, so I'm going to connect the glasses to the speakers so you all can hear what the glasses are talking to me. So we're going to be maybe identifying a few objects here and reading a magazine. But if, you're going to have to bear with me, because I need to set it up quickly. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to um, show you how the shopping experience works. We're going to identify a few products here. And if anyone wants Doritos, we're going to leave them here. Um, OK, so I have the smart glasses here. The ones we use is the ones you see in the picture. It's Vuzix M100, probably one of the cheaper versions of uh, smart glasses around. By the way, if you think that the only smart glasses are the Google Glass and they're failed, you you probably, this information is out of date. There's more than two dozen different smart glasses on the market. They look great. I'm going to show you a few pictures in, in a moment. So I'm just clip these smart glasses onto my glasses, or any specs, and I'm going to launch the application quickly and set it up, and let's see if it's going to work. OK. So right. It says connected. Let's see. This is a. What's that? Go ahead, yogurt, something. Detect go ahead, forest fruits, yogurt breaks. OK. That worked. Some Doritos. Let's see if I get the flavor right. Detect Doritos, chili heat waves. Ah, chili, right, OK. Got lucky this time. That was easy, right? Because this is just a simple object, a little bit of text. More complicated story is like, how do you access big volumes of information? So you have a magazine, it's printed, right? So how can we read a document or, um, or maybe a book? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to launch 
a different application here. And we're going to try and read Wired Magazine latest edition with my friend Mark here. I'm just kidding. We're not friends, sadly. Um, OK. I'll just launch it here. Um, right. OK. I'm going to sit down. Uh, OK. Give vision. So I'm going to find some sort of a chunky article here. We're going to go for a number one, so you don't think I'm cheating you guys. So we're going to try and recognize a few articles here with some bit of text. Um, OK, let me just connect. And I think we're live. Oh, here we go. This is an article about some guys doing drones. OK. Page 39, headline, fly. So he goes through headlines fly. now, and Marco I'm going to Kovac tell him to read it out to me. That can walk, swim, and perch. Mirko Kovac wants to create bio-inspired flying drones to do our dirty work for us. Okay. As director of the aerial robotics So you can see the speed of it, right? Imperial so it, there's a lot of there's a lot of text in here. I took a snap. I can just keep walking right now, and it's still reading it to me. I'm going to try to find another big chunk of text here. Accessible or dangerous such as underwater oil pipelines um, or remote wind turbines. Okay, let's try this. Perform better working I'm going to tell him to stop. Than in isolation. And I'm going to look at it. Page 9, headline, flock, page 56, headline, Quest will capture about a million tons of CO2 PER year, equivalent to talking 250,000 cars off the road. Okay, let's see. If you think about it. Yeah, here we go. He starts reading again. You use so while it's reading in the background, you can imagine Every little page to the okay, blind people will get the same post that you would get, so they need to read the documents. Or if they're in school, they need to read the textbooks. Or if they're, you know, in the work environment, they have some printed documents or presentations to attend. By the way, that's the demo. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, it, if we can convert physical printed text or physical objects around you in your environment into a bits of information. There's a lot of other things you can do, and I'm going to talk about these things today. However, before we jump into this, I wanted to talk a little bit about our approach to accessibility. A lot of the times people think, well, if you don't have sight or if you don't have hearing, we need to restore that, and we're going to make you sort of that complete human being. We took a little bit different approach to accessibility. We thought, let's look at the use cases. Let's look at the what you need to get done at work, at, at school, at home, and let's try and have, develop applications that will help you to do that and do that more effectively than your sighted colleagues could do. So then you don't feel that you're lacking behind because you're you know, disabled or differently abled. However, if we could build an application that will make you super efficient without, you know, getting information, processing stuff, even without sight, we could also give these buyers to sighted people, amplifying their abilities, sort of the idea of this Iron Man. And this is kind of a, something I'm going to be trying to sell here today. A one example story, other than Give Vision, I like to use is, of course, of Hugh Herr. And I'm not sure if any of you guys saw his TED talk. This is an MIT scientist that built his super bionic legs here. And he used to be a climber, but 30 years ago, he lost um, le his, his, his limbs, so his legs. And, and he built his legs. And now he can climb twice or so three times faster, higher. Um, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, he's testing these limbs here. Kind of almost like becoming a superhuman with these legs, sort of bionic legs, which we think it's a good metaphor for what we're kind of trying to do here. So a few telling stories, um, how can this be possible with augmented reality and smart glasses? First of all, as I promised, I wanted to give you a few pictures of other glasses on the market. So these are uh, Meta Pro. These are smart glasses with big heads-up displays, a few cameras. But also, there's a smaller, um, smaller sort of nicer glasses out there without the screens. Just have a camera and a few sensors, which might be enough for someone. So the first example we like to use is information consumption. So we've built a number of applications for partially sighted people to be able to look at text and augment the site, augment the sort of the video feed enable, to enable partially sighted people to read text, not just to listen to it. And if you've ever seen this app, Spritz, where it gives you like one word at a time for speed reading, and this is a very similar concept. So rather than them following with a magnifier line by line of the text, that we would convert all the text and present it to them one word at a time. 
and that looks something like this. But a little bit slower for them. However, if this can work for a partially sighted person, what about the sighted people? If you could just look at the book, or you look at your magazine or a paper you need to read, and you can just speed read it with the help of the smart glasses, that means, at least for me, that's three times as fast as I could read. It can also, we can link here to your emails, we can link it to your you know, browsing web and reading blog articles, etc. You could consume information at three times the speed. I think this is a pretty cool example. Second example is enhanced memory. So one of the things we do is, as you just as you see now, if you can read a magazine or you can sort of recognize objects, we don't have to delete it. We can store it. So every article you've read today, every presentation you've seen, every conversation perhaps you've had can be recorded and then transcribed into text, which makes it very easy afterwards to search by either location, time when you took the note, or keywords. So if you ever dreamt about, and you can access that information really, like it's, it, this becomes a super brain. Like, like you know, everyone wanted to have a memory like Mike Ross from Suits. I love Suits. So that's the idea. Can we have a memory pack carrying around us and have this supernatural memory ability? Obviously, this kind of raises the question of privacy. Do I want my conversations to be recorded? Um, do I want you know people wearing cameras and where I work and sort of look around? That's kind of for, for, for our project right now. It's not big of an issue, but it can be, and this is something that needs to be solved. Um, this is a more of a controversial example. Um, we, one of the first applications we had to build was to build face recognition for blind people. They want to know who's in the room, if someone's left the room, or if, who are they sitting? Like, if do I know somebody? That's an important thing. Also, emotions. Can they? Is a person smiling? Are they bored? They want to know this stuff. And when we build a prototype, one of the first things, of course, we build face recognition. But it can go a step further right now. So this is a project from MIT. This is an open source. Pretty much everyone can sort of tweak it to make it available in smart glasses, which amplifies your tiny head movements or the changes in your color of your skin to pick up your heart rate. So I'm looking at you there, and I can tell your heart rate which is, you can make a leap from that, and I can sort of start predicting, are you lying to me? Are you interested? Are you bored? Are you hiding something from me? Which probably another thing that I wouldn't like people to know about me, right? If you're, if you're just sitting there. But, but we already can do that with cameras because they're more powerful than human eye. And wearing this camera on your face gives us great ability. And combine it with a little bit of um, uh, sort of tracking your tiny motions of your facial muscles, we can very accurately predict the emotions as well. Again, same question, privacy. Would I want people around me to know how I feel and if I'm lying to them? Maybe not. Would I want law enforcement officers to be able to be more efficient and figure out if there's a criminal in front of them? I don't know. A question. Um, this brings us to sort of so, so one point I wanted to make about how is this relevant to the healthcare? We have this sort of issue here of we have an aging population. More and more people are going to live longer, and we had to have much fewer young people at work to support the older people who are already in retirement age. And that kind of ever increasing healthcare bill. And that's not sustainable. So either we will have to cut in the next 20, 25 years, start cutting our healthcare services, cut the budgets and make the basically health service shittier. Or we need to innovate in the way we deliver care, and we deliver health care. So our example, maybe it's more towards the care. How can we take care of people that otherwise would need some um, assistance and, and can, become, can live independently? Uh, but I think this is a very important topic to address today. Um, and, and a few bits about the AR and future of AR as we see it today, other than healthcare. So the first is, as I mentioned, is access to information. If you could access relevant information at the right time, that would give us ability to process more and just be, be able to make better decisions. Usually this bad decisions are made because of lack of information and not being informed. But nobody is fully informed, so we always have imperfect information. We always have imperfect decisions. So that's number one. And we really see a lot of projects moving towards that. Number two is enhanced memory, as I just showed you, ability to store a lot of information and access it quickly. Um, we know very well that um, 
a human brain has a limit. Even if you do develop your memory, short-term memory, long-term memory have its limits. And if we don't use information often, we just, it, brain just deletes it. Why, which should, why should we? Why should we have it? Why could we have our memory stored permanently and access them quickly? Another idea we had here um, with, with, with sharing images and sharing memories, when we find ways to um, share, so everybody who carries an iPhone today and you can take qu pictures quickly of whatever they're eating today or where they are and some cool stuff going around. What if you have camera on your face and you didn't even have to make an action to take a picture? You could take pictures every couple of seconds or maybe you can just blink and take a picture. A matter of different visual data that we can publish and start putting out in the web will obviously will be increasing. And uh, we've seen the s presentation on the first day of Instagram and how these, uh, how these platforms scale and they grow. They're only five years old, and this is a massive company, and everybody's already on Instagram. Ability to capture data faster will give, us, will give, the, will give ability not only to have much more interesting moments and experiences to share, but also some, some futuristic idea of sharing memories and maybe trading memories, which we found really fascinating. And the last bit was a little bit more about gesture control. So if you guys are all fans of futuristic movies and you've seen uh, Minority Report where, uh, with, with a, where you can sort of control your devices with head motions and sort of gestures. If you have a pair of smart glasses on your face with a number of sensors and a camera, it can recognize what you're doing, what you're looking at, start A, predicting what you might need right now, and B, just track your hand motions to control devices around you. And we've seen a number of great, uh, great projects already in this space um, where you can, you can sort of augment the reality and, and start putting your user interface from a smartphone or a PC into this virtual world and augment it. And I think being able to interact with our devices without having to take something out of your pocket and find it and press the button, I think this is fantastic for both visually impaired people or disabled people as well as most of us here. And I think this is, oh uh, yeah, of course. For us to move forward, we need to address the problem of privacy. We need to address the problem of, of new legislation. How do we hand, handle, how do we gather and handle data? Um, we've seen a lot of problems with Google Glass and Google Glass glass holes, um, people are just not confident yet with other people wearing cameras around you. So we, see, we think this is going to be a solvable challenge. We're going to address it pretty soon. Not we, but you know, market will address it. But this is obviously an obstacle right now. So this is us. Uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter, givevision.net. Um, and it was a pleasure to be here today. Thank you.